So welcome to this closing gala event of the Sustaining Our Future 2021 20, online festival. Uh, as many of you know, uh, this was to have been a live poetry reading in our church uh, with jazz. And uh, we intend that this shall happen as soon as possible. Uh, so uh, that event is still in the making, but as soon as we're able to gather in person in the church, we'll be there uh, with a more convivial atmosphere. And uh, we very much hope you can join us. So keep posted about that. Uh, but for now, we are doing an online reading and it's wonderful to have you all here. We look forward to welcoming a few more faces as well. Uh, so my name is Tim Watson. Uh, I am the Anglican Rector of Holy Cross Anglican Church Hackett, uh, which you can see behind me. Uh, the cherry tree is not pink anymore, uh, except in our hearts. Um, but uh, we've had a, a really joyful time in the last month. And, and of course, this festival is co-hosted by Holy Cross Anglican and St Margaret's Uniting. Uh, so these two churches which have shared the site in North Canberra and worked in cooperating partnership uh, here for the last 50 years and more, uh, it's a great joy for me to be part of that relationship uh, and to share uh, a space which is open to a wide range of convictions and doubts, even from within the Christian space. Uh, so this is very much part of who we are. Uh, and before we go any further, I just want to thank all the members of the Social Justice and Environment Group at the church who've worked so hard to make this festival a reality in these strange times. So uh, those are my thanks, although of course I need to thank our poets as well, but maybe I'll do that at the end. Um, and now I'll do an acknowledgement of country. So we meet, of course, uh, those of us who are in Australia, this is the internet, so you could come from anywhere. Uh, but we meet uh, on Aboriginal land uh, and we acknowledge the traditional custodians of these lands. Here where I sit, these are the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. Uh, Jeff is also on that land, John is down the coast on the lands of the Walbanga Nation and you may be in all sorts of different places around Australia. Uh, so we acknowledge those traditional custodians. I think maybe in terms of the internet we can maybe say a word for the dream time which was maybe its anticipation in myth and story. Uh, and uh, we pay our respects to the leaders of those peoples past, present and emerging. And we give thanks, uh, thanks to God, uh, those of us who believe in God, uh, thanks to the Creator Spirit for the communion we share now and we entrust the future of that communion and the justice of our relationships to uh, the goodwill of all people, of all faiths and none. So uh, this is a reading, it's a reading, we've given it a theme of conviction and doubt uh, and I just want to make really clear that this is not in the red corner uh, the Christian poet uh, and in the green corner the agnostic poet uh, conviction and doubt is not like that. Uh, conviction and doubt is uh, it's a complex dynamic. It's You can call it a double helix or you can call it a matrix. Uh, conviction and doubt covers a wide range of responses to all those complex questions which make up life. Uh, and then maybe there's a sense in which the most important of those questions can only really be addressed poetically. Uh, there, are, there are things you can't solve with a mathematics problem. Uh, if I may just issue a word of critique to my own Christian community, there are times when Christians try to solve problems as if they can be divided into binary solutions. And if there's one thing that we can learn from voices such as Jeff and John is that that's absolutely not how the world is. Uh, so we look forward to sharing those questions with you both, uh, John and Jeff. It's, it's been a joy to get to know you both over the last month or so, and it's a joy to have you here in our Zoom room. Um, so uh just one final thing to say at this point uh we will have a bit of a q a at the end uh and we're going to suggest that you put your questions in the chat uh and then we can pick them out and ask them towards the end of our meeting so if you have any questions or responses that come during the reading please put them into the chat and then we can uh pick them up later on if that's okay um so i think that's more than enough from me uh so i'm now going to uh put the spotlight on our two speakers uh, so uh, I won't read out their CVs because I think most of you will know them already, but it's a joy to have them with us uh, and they are two of uh, Australia's finest poetic voices. So we're very lucky to have you in the room, Jeff and John. And uh, I will retreat into the background and just manage the, the, the Zoom, but I will re-emerge occasionally with, with uh, a couple of contributions as we go. But I'll, I'll put the spotlight on you for uh, both now and we can just take it from here. So. Jeff first, and now John. There we are, so over to you. I think you need to unmute yourselves if that's okay. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm right. Lovely, that's great. Jeff, who is, I'm right. who's beginning, Jeff, you or me? You or you are going to go first. With, is okay, is I'll go first. Yeah. What, um, well, just good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming. What Jeff and I have decided to do uh, tonight is to read poems alternately. Um, and these poems won't necessarily talk to each other, um, but they will bring uh, the kind of difference, uh, the different sort of viewpoints that we have or the different standpoints that we have, uh, and hopefully break up us being a bit boring by just having us uh, to let into um, lace like that. I'm going to, to read out six poems tonight, uh, Interlaced with Jeff, um, starting at reading chrono chronologically. And I'm going to read, first of all, a poem from my first second book published in 1987. And I'm finishing up uh, with a book from my book past, published just last year. Uh, which was just last week, uh, which was Dancing with Stephen Hawking. But I want to start with a poem called Reading Josephus. This um, poem deals with a section of Josephus I, I once um, fleetingly read about, and sometimes I don't even know if I do did read it, um, but it was a description of Christ uh, that comes in that poem. Reading Josephus. Once reading Cephas, I found this description of Christ. He was a black man, well, very nearly black, tarred with the Palestinian sun and shorter than most. His hair was never cut, his nose beaked over, farcically Jewish, hunchbacked as well. A haversack of gristle and meat lugged about, eyes pressing his spine down eyes tilting to the sand before him. Imagine that, those hefty wooden verbs dragged out and thrown before the listeners, not slime at all, not the easy construction of a man nailed upright. This was a lame saviour, glazed with sweat, heart pounding from the body hall up to Calvary, where his tall disciples and the squat metal guards had to bend back their necks to see him hammered out straight at last, ascending with all the pretty angels. Over to you, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, John. I've liked that poem for a very long time. Uh, this poem I'll read is called Christ at Gallipoli, and I wrote it just over 50 years ago now. It's appalling to think. And it happened I was uh, attending a dawn service, intending to be part of an anti-Vietnam War demonstration, but other people didn't turn up and the service went ahead. And uh, I heard, I think it was a padre, uh, give a sermon which I acutely disagreed with. And uh, he was going back to a statement the Anglican Synod made in Melbourne in 1916. And they said this, this Synod is convinced that the forces of the allies are being used of God to vindicate the rights of the weak and to maintain the moral order of the world. So this is from the viewpoint of one of the diggers there. Bit weird at first, that starey look in the eye, the hair down past his shoulders, but after a go with a ship's barber, a seawater shower and the old slouch hat across his ears, he started to look the part. Took him a while to get the way a bayonet fits the only Enfield, but going in on the boats, he looked calmer than any of us, just gazing in over the swell where the cliffs looked black against the sky. When we hit, he fairly raced in through the waves, then up the beach, swerving like a fullback at the end when the Turks had really got onto us. Time we all caught up, he was off like a flash up the cliffs after his first machine gun. He'd done for three Turks when we got there. The fourth was a gibbering mess. Seeing him wave that blood red bayonet, I reckon we were glad to have him on the side. John. The next poem I'm going to read, I, I think I published it in 1995 and it's a much, excuse me, I've got a problem with a uh, firearm here. Won't be a minute.
I'm just going to leap in at this point then. Uh, bells often sound in church, don't they? There's a plenty of poetry about that too. <laughs> but uh, I'm just going to make one comment, if I may, from my um, curator's chair here, um, which is to note how these first two poems um, are, of course, about the person of Jesus. They're, they're taking us onto historical terrain. Uh, and they're both personal responses to that figure, that historical figure. Uh, it seemed to me, you know, well, the two things in common between them was that they, they mentioned a Jesus who had long hair and that they both raised issues about race. Um, yeah. But it's interesting. It seems to me that the figure of Jesus, who, of course, has inspired so much art over the last 2000 years, is so susceptible to receive all of our projections uh, and fantasies in different ways. And then there are a whole different ways of layers of identification um, with Jesus in his humanity. Uh, and different ways in which those identifications can challenge us. Uh, and I thought I'd just ask, a, just raise a question with, please feel free to do with it what you wish. You know, in terms of conviction and doubts, to what extent do you think it's significant that the Christian story is based around a story and not a theory? Uh, are you asking me? Well, if you want to chip in and respond, I, I, I'll, or, or just leave it to just one briefly, side. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, stories are nearly always more persuasive than pure philosophy or pure theology. And uh, so it doesn't surprise me at all that the Old Testament and the Gospels are, are full of stories and parables and so on. And I think they're very effective, you know, a good way of doing things. Uh, yeah, I, I'd agree with uh, Jeff on that one. Um, it seems to me that um, we learn through story. Uh, and the story of Jesus, probably one of the most uh, well-known stories in human history, uh, and with good reason. Um, and, uh, I think, of course, the question is, you know, the, the difference between fiction and, uh, and fact. I don't really want to go into that at the moment, but that would be an obvious question uh, that religious people may ask. Mm. Thank you both. Um, I'll, get, I'll go into the background again and let you get on with some poems. I'd just like, I'd just like to apologise, first of all. My, I don't know what happened, but my fire alarm went off. Um, um, oh, my wife just told me a spider crawled across it. Um, so that's why it went off. It's a godly spider, I think, trying to shut me up. Um, with further ado, uh, the second poem I'm going to read, as I say, I wrote it in 1995. It's a question or, or a, a rationale why I go to church, but um, it gives an answer that's not really an answer. Why I go to church. Often in the stone yellow light of a Sunday morning service, waiting to get home, I'll feel something in the congregation's forgetfulness, something for a moment more real than commerce, more physical than a touch, a kiss, humming with the echo of stars, the thin ice of galaxies on those nights when everyone else is asleep. At communion, only the instant of kneeling, the few whispered words, a taste. I'm reminded then of sunset from a headland. Over the river, houses nestle and the moored yachts are like pelicans. Two children on the sand, running and hurling themselves among fingers of seaweed, resting on a moon-polished tide. This moment that doesn't lift away, which is stored forever in the list of all remembered things, some of which have happened. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah. Uh, the next poem I'll read is called Miracles, and I think it deals with a central problem in Christianity, which various answers have been provided for, but uh, which still fail to convince me personally. It's interesting that uh, Les Murray, he saw this poem late in his life, and he said, I, funny, I missed that earlier on, but he, he congratulated me on it and said, it's a good one, so you make your minds up. It's called Miracles. The problem of evil and man's free will, the babies on the bayonets. God set it up so long ago 
intending it should all make sense. The killers and their free will few are dancing to an ancient law. And miracles are just what happens when God can't bear it anymore. Thank you, Jeff. I love that poem too. And uh, in uh, a bit of um, synchronicity, I've got a poem here, which in its own way is also about the problem of evil and the problem of pain. It's called Des Hommes et Dieu. And it's based on uh, Xavier Beauvoir's film of 2010, which is of gods and men, uh, uh, which details the story of a, a group of um, Catholic uh, monks who are stationed in Algeria uh, during the uh, uprising against the French government there. Uh, and they are threatened by um, uh, Muslim extremists, but they, they will not leave the village because um, Muslim villagers there uh, are their friends and they work together and they know what's coming, um, but they wait and they wait for what comes. Um, Brother Luke is uh, the main uh, person in this poem, and he's the doctor group. Brother Luke hoards medicine to help the villagers, but gives them a healing that's really only words. The brothers open hands. The brothers know their separate lives amount, amount to weeks or days. Brother Luke is little more than seconds in the wind. Older than the others, he knows the weight of things. He knows the bitter verdict of charity and love. He prays for less and less. This evening after mass, he crouches by the Christ who hauls his splintered cross. He leans against the Saviour's breast and checks the heartbeat there. He runs his stumpy fingers along a bloodied skin. He nestles close to death. His breath is like an angelus. The night rolls over him. He curls against the chapel wall and sleeps there like a child. Mm. Certainly a good poem on conviction. Uh, I'll read this poem called uh, Credo, which is just summarizes my viewpoint in a fairly simple way perhaps. Credo. The dark night of the soul agnostic prefers the right to doubt. The world's too much beset by those who know what they're about. The dark night of the soul agnostic says yes, maybe, although he has his own utopias, but would like you to know that in a year or so he might prefer another view. And even all his skeptics faith could one day vanish too. But this he's fairly sure would fade and doubt come back once more. The dark night of the soul agnostic does not besiege your door. He builds no temple out of bricks and does not like to preach. He thinks conviction or impressive slightly out of reach. Thanks, Jeff. Slightly out of reach. Yes. Um, I'm going to read a, a prose poem now, which is one of my doubt poems. Um, this poem is called At the Crusade, and um, many people have gone through uh, Billy Graham Crusade. At the Crusade, this is a prose poem. I am with my brother. Before us, the Sydney cricket ground is serrated with seats. But in the stands, far from salvation, we sit. On the stage, Billy Graham, a black suit and a Bible. He is tall and confident, like a man in a cigarette commercial. His eyes are fixed and distant. His voice spills across this space made for games. It is like a cloudburst, a sudden downpour. In the stands, we are parched. Are you ready to let Jesus into your heart? I am thinking of the absence in our house, of the way my mother goes from room to room. I am thinking of the quiet since my father died that is muddy and thick. 
Come down now, come down to the stage and give your heart to Jesus. Look up, the sky is scraping over the stands. I think of the earth trudging on its axis, trudging round and around. Something is tumbling down the long alley of the afternoon. The buses will wait. I op open my mouth and whisper to my brother, are you going? But he stares at nothing, as if we were, we were at a school assembly, always under scrutiny. He moves his lips like a ventriloquist. Don't be fucking stupid. For a moment, there is an ordinariness to things, sheer and billowy. The sound of my feet on the concrete beneath the seat, the sound I make as I shift and settle. The sound of other people going down. Yeah, thanks, John. That's another one I really like. Uh, this next one of mine is a narrative poem as well, actually, and it's a story that was told to me by John's wife, Jane Fulcher, who's, who's an Anglican clergy person. And uh, this is what happened at her first first service in a, in a, a country church. Uh, the details might be slightly wrong, but I think basically it is correct. This is as she told it to me, and then I've just added my final comment. Maybe I'll just make this comment that uh, I think it's important for agnostic. In fact, a sign of the true agnostic is to recognise the sincerity and the, the reality of other people's convictions, you know, that uh, uh, we're very slow, proper agnostics to condemn other beliefs. So I'll try to get that at the end of this poem a bit. Jane's story. My friend Jane, the clergywoman, slender as a silver birch, loves to tell the story of her first time at a country church and how the guy who told the bell was out of town or in poor health and how in all her priestly gear she'd had to man the rope herself. But not high there above her head, it's fibre hefty as the tone of that high single bell above her, set to ring at 14 stone, the normal sexton's weight on scale, a measure of his noble girth and how he'd ring all 33 years that Christ had spent on earth, and how such ringing lifted her that many times above the ground, soaring high as if to heaven, then parachuting gently down. The ways of Christ would not be easy, she saw while flailing through the air, clinging to that godly stock whip, cracking in the belfry there. Until all done, she smoothed her robes and strolled inside to pray and preach. Red-faced as the wine she held, she gave Christ's body each to each. John, you're muted, I see. <laughs> we can't hear you, so. But I, I just said to Jeff, thank you so much for obvious reasons. I'm very fond of that poem. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful poem. Thank Absolutely. And, and at what point did you guys decide actually to buy a church to live in, John? That's what I want to know. <laughs> uh, about 10 years ago, um, it was a, a whim of passion. Um, and that's where we live. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's wonderful to have your personal stories woven through all of this. I, I just wanted to break in and say two things. One is that uh, just to remind people at the end of this, um, we'll have an opportunity for a bit of a Q&A. Uh, we decided that we wouldn't make this a particularly long uh, reading because Zoom is a quite a fatiguing medium. But uh, at the end, we're, we're very happy to have a, a discussion with some questions. So if, if you want to get thinking about that and put some questions in the chat, you're very welcome. Uh, and we can also open the microphone at that point for a bit of a conversation if, if that's what you'd like to do. Um, the second thing is that I, I'm very aware in the last few poems you've very much illustrated what we said at the start about the, the fact of conviction and doubt being a kind of double helix or the bell rope going up and down. Uh, and on our own particular journeys, uh, we come at, to different points on that particular kind of sine wave, I guess. Uh, and so I thought I'd just ask you, um, what are the things, you've already mentioned some in your poems, I know, but what are those things which make you most doubt your own convictions? Uh, I could say one thing, uh, the intelligence of a lot of Christians. 
very annoying. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the fact that like Les Murray and Kevin Hart, are two very good poets, one unfortunately left us now, uh, I always feel they're sort of substantially higher IQ than I am and uh, therefore they could possibly be right, but I still, that's not enough to convince me per se. Uh, I could say lots more, but that'll do. Um, I could return the favour and say the intelligence of agnostics, Jeff. Uh, well, um, I find it hard to say. I, I, I think I live constantly in a loop of um, conviction and doubt or faith and doubt. Uh, and some days um, I feel quite strongly that the, that, that the Christian story that I ascribe to is at the heart of everything and other days i wake up and um everything seems bleak uh and uh, nihilistic and pointless um i i think for me it's probably the thing it is for everybody which is the problem of pain and suffering how does an all good god um how does there come to be evil in the world how does he allow it to use the colloquial phrase um, so, so that's what keeps me on my toes, Tim. The world of poetry keeps me on my toes as well, uh, because uh, like Jeff, there are so many people I love and respect in the world of poetry who don't think as I do. Mm. Thank you both. Those are very, very heartfelt and personal responses. Uh, so I'll drift into the background again and let you give us some more poems. John's turn. Who are we up to, Jeff? You? Oh, right, okay. Um, or not? Yeah. It's it's me, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read another church poem, but it's a very different one to yours, Jeff. Her brother is dead. She has only now heard that her brother is dead. Her breath is falling about. He's dead. He can't be. He can't be dead. Her husband holds her as if she were made of finely cut glass. He says practical things and they go into the week of clutching and silence. The funeral is out past Conoundra. Her family have filled the pews. The rest of us stand around outside like a lynch mob. When everyone is there, the service is sown to the trees and to the sky. God arrives fashionably late, but no one has much to him. He has his place among the prayers. Afterwards, at the wake, he shuffles around like a divorcee. He does not stay long. There is the future to get on with. Later, she texts us, saying, to walk out of that church and see you all under that Karajong tree meant the world to me. When she walked out of the church and stood beneath the portal cross, it was as if she was searching for her brother, as if he would be late for his own funeral. The cross should be sharpened, I thought, like a stake. It should go deep into the earth. How else, I thought, could it carry a man? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, the next one I'll read is uh, probably wrote about 12 years ago. I was walking outside the Catholic Cathedral in Monica, and it was uh, the pruners, I think they're pruners, uh, they're blooming outside and the bells were going and uh, one of those moments which sort of trouble agnostics, but not entirely. So this is, a, I think this is as close as I get to a, a genuinely religious poem. I think the impulse is, is religious. Uh, it's called Not Quite Nothing. An evening of prunus blooms is made more fragile by the bells ringing in both mass and spring. The story they're supposed to tell has proved too complex. Sexless birth, a levitation straight to heaven, the search for extra miracles, the mysteries at three and seven. The narrative I'm learning here might be perhaps more simply told. 
Hillsong preachers threaten fire, but fail to feel the heat and cold so finely balanced in this dusk. Such subtleties resist their powers. Remember, you are not quite nothing. The bells are saying, and the flowers. Jeff, that's a very upbeat note to finish on. And I want to finish on an upbeat note too. This poem is called Dancing with Stephen Hawking. Uh, it's the title poem of my latest book uh, called Dancing with Stephen Hawking. It's about a friend of mine who actually did dance with Stephen Hawking. Uh, and the poem is actually based on her experience. I was living in England, punk days they were. On my way to the party, I fell and scraped skin from my knees, tore my stockings. No matter, they were punk days. I looked the part, black root, blonde, makeup slurring my face. And there she was. He wants to dance with you. And there he was, seeping into his chair, mind in the machine. From a distance, I thought him all thought, the body's ruin, savaging desire, but something simmered there. He rolled across the wooden floor, a ship leaving harbour, adrift on a wide sea. I did my best punk moves, spasmodic thrusts and jumps, while he swayed left and right in his choreography of wheels. I tried not to despair. We moved until the music comes into silence, left everyone talking too loud for a moment, like the noise of insects in the dark. I don't recall talking at all, only the time given. Walking to the station, I stopped, looked up to a moonless sky, wondering whether that cloud was a cloud or a galaxy. And I thought of the dance of asteroids, the merciless pull of black holes, red giants and white dwarfs, breathless nebulae. I thought of the atoms in my eyes spinning and spin and the torrent of light surging through me, soaking me to the bone as I stood looking up with my bloodied knees. Yeah. And I think we're both done, aren't we, Jeff? <laughs> We had five, six, and I've got to read my sixth one yet. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> when? Uh, I'll read this one. Uh, it's, I wrote it only uh, a year or two ago, and uh, <clears throat> it refers to a prayer plant, a prayer plant that Latin name is Maranta Lucanura, and it raises its leaves at night in prayer. That's why it's called a prayer plant. It comes from, the, from Brazil. And it's the only horticultural achievement that I have almost in my whole life. So, Miranda Lucanura. My prayer plant is a Christmas gift from 20 years ago. A couple long since split, gone on to love and have their kids elsewhere and well past bitterness. This plant, the only one I keep, has been their long memento. Each night in my agnostic flat, it lifts its leaves in prayer for me, no doubt, and yet my doubt continues undeterred. The plant's a neat synecdoche, a small thing standing in for all the forests of Brazil. So far, that's been enough. In winter, it dries out and straggles. In spring, I prune it brutally, snipping with my scissors. Its rebirth is impressive. New leaves roll tight as cigarillos gradually unfold, velvet in their green and black some white small flowers to come. Underwatered, overwatered, each year it keeps on bouncing back, determined to outlive me. A few leaves from the world's great lungs at bay among my books. If souls exist and need repair, then maybe this uncertain one is in its steady care. So that's the end of the six poems that John and I were reading. We've probably got one or two others up our sleeves if we need them. Uh, over to you, Tim. Well, thank you very much. They're 
there's a really beautiful collection of poems there. I, I really appreciated them. Uh, and just a quick on the, on the spot reaction from me. There are just two images which can come to mind as I think back on what we've heard. Uh, one is bells, uh, not least in tribute to John's fire alarm. Uh, but the way in which that the image of the bell can speak in so many ways. And the other is galaxies. Uh, and I'm going to put in a bid that when we do meet in person, we will, we will sing Under the Milky Way by the church. <laughs> uh, you'll have the T-shirt to it. <laughs> Absolutely. So there we are. And, and I should shout out to Peter Martin at Holy Cross, who introduced me to that song uh, being sung by Jimmy Little. So, uh, again, if you want to check that out, do by all means. I hope you find what you were looking for and such like. Um, so uh, why don't we go over to the chat? So why don't I, um, again, for the purposes of the recording and, and everything else, uh, I'm going to just do the questions, if I may. Uh, so we've got a question from John Goss. Um, hi, John. Good to have you with us. Uh, how important are conviction or doubt in determining what we say or do? Perhaps conviction and doubt are actually overrated. <laughs> John got first. Uh, I um, I used to be an English drama teacher, and uh, whenever they'd need um, someone to teach religious studies, um, I'd take up the slack. Um, and what I used to say to kids there, um, and I'd made, I, I would make them move on the basis of this. Um, I'd ask them whether they believed in God or not, um, and they'd all say predictably. We don't know. And I said, yeah, we're all, we're all agnostics, actually. Um, none of us know. Um, but we live as if there is something else or as if there's not. Um, we know, which is very little. And I said, if, I would always say to them, you know, if, if somebody had to make you, where would you sit? On which side of the room? And they'd go up there. But... Um, I, I really think, you know, belief and conviction, are, they are overrated because so many people stuff it up, don't they? There is so much, as people have often said, there's so much evil in the world um, done by people with the best of intentions or uh, with the best of beliefs or, or something. But for me, it does matter. Uh, it does matter what I believe. Um, and it does affect how I act. Um, I'll just leave it there for the moment. Jeff, you can you can take up the slack there. Yeah, that's a big question. I, I wouldn't say doubt and conviction are overrated. I'd say that they're frequently misunderstood and oversimplified, both of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think doubt is particularly important uh, because uh, there's so much is done recklessly and without sufficient thought and precipitously and yeah. a lot of bad things wouldn't happen if people spend a bit more time thinking about whether they're right now you might want to refer to a text you know a holy text uh, to make that decision uh, or you might want to refer to a system that you've worked out roughly and incidentally over a lifetime uh, you know in a more existential sort of way and uh, I, I personally feel that it's extremely hard to have a really solid foundation. I'm with the philosopher Richard Rorty, who is a, an anti-foundationalist. I think that's just impossible to have a secure foundation. So once you accept that, then where do you go after that? You don't go into spiritual and political apathy, but you, you go into uh, more thought about what you do think is worthwhile and what can be done and negotiating with other people. He's very big on uh, discussing and telling stories to other groups to try to reach some commonality, some some positive viewpoint. I said we don't we don't preach, but that's a little preach. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. I, I, as you were answering, I was just thinking about the gap between what you think you're doing and what you're actually doing. You know, and I, yeah, I, yeah. John, John, you and I were you shared with us of when we were speaking a year or so ago about the poetic process and. And I think I remember someone was asking you, you know, do you know where a poem's going when you start? Uh, and I think you said, no, you don't, you know. So in a sense, you know, you might think you're going to write a poem about X and then the process of making takes you on a journey um, where you find out what you're doing as you go, I guess. 
So that that was just I just wanted to reflect that back, John. The poem actually tells you where it's going, not the other way around. Um, I, I've always said that writing poems, it's a bit like having children. Um, when you have children, you want them to grow up in a certain way. But the little bastards have, the ha this habit of going their own way and wanting to do their own thing. Poems are the same. They go their own way. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just have to go with them uh, or, or drop them. Yeah. Yeah. That's very powerful. I'd agree. One thing I'd just add to that is I think... Uh, the whole business of writing poetry has made me aware that there are things that are happening while you're writing poems and any substantial piece of writing, I suppose, uh, which make you realise that you're not fully in control, that things are happening that are beyond your control and your own initiative. And that's one of the things that stops me being an atheist and makes me more an agnostic, you know, that there are things uh, that I, I can't fully explain. I don't think science can fully explain them either. Mm. I mean, Bruce Stevens has just come in with a, a question on that point, which is beauty and truth, brackets, Keats, relevant to poetry. Mm -hmm. And I think one could chuck in another pair as well, which is actually art and faith and the way in which they interact. You know, I think, didn't Nietzsche call Christianity poor little talkative Christianity? But one of the paradoxes I feel is that I, I'm not sure that Christians today, um, one of the ways you can tell whether we're doing what we should be doing is whether or not we are generating things of great beauty uh, and com complex provocations rather than thinness, you know. So it, how about beauty and truth and the interaction between those two or, or indeed the, the interaction between faith and art? I think um, is right. I think uh, beauty is truth and truth abuse. But like everything in poetry, it's not quite that simple. Um, what poetry does is take the ugliness of the world and turn it into this beautiful object uh, and some of the most uh, hideous uh, works of art um, have, have portrayed the most awful things in the most beautiful way. But somehow, uh, by making things beautiful, they give them dignity. Um, they vindicate who we are uh, yeah. and um, uh, our worth and our value and our shortcomings too uh, and our, our flaws. So... I, I think I think Keats was right. Beauty and truth are the same thing. Even when truth yeah, is uh, ugly, it's still, yeah. yeah. I just I agree with most of that, but I I just add that uh, there are things in the world that are not works of art that are beautiful. So not not everything, not all works of art are inherently beautiful, as you say. Many are quite ugly and to be convincing they need to have that that ugliness you know that is part of the way they approach the whole problem so you can have uh poems that are sort of beautiful in one sense and repugnant in another sense i, I think what what i'd say uh, there jeff is that they um they depict ugly things but the artifice of their yeah. creation is beautiful yeah yeah uh yeah there are some really nice poems written by really bad people, you know. <laughs> Excluding ourselves. And some really bad poems written by good people. They're much more new. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe we'll have an open mic next time and explore that question existentially. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. No, but, but thank you. Um, and I think I, I'll just, you know, we, we've had a few other questions as we go along, but uh, I'm just going to throw in one now because I think we're coming to nearly the end of our time. And I'm just going to tell you the question which we, we, we discussed earlier on. Uh, I'm aware of the fact that you both have poetic careers lasting quite a while and, and uh, you know, you've been on a, a bit of a life journey in this respect. And, and in terms of as people of faith and views as well, we all have views and we change as we go. In terms of these questions of conviction and doubt, what would you both say to your younger selves if you had that opportunity? Jeff, you can start. <laughs> uh, well, my younger self was fairly cautious and I think I'd still say to him, you know, be cautious, uh, don't rush in, think twice. Uh, and yet don't, uh, don't be sort of emotionally cauterized by that hesitation, there are times when you have to take a, a decision and, and take a risk and 
uh, you know, uh, Eliot's got that line about the great refusal, you know, someone says it's not always a good thing to make the great refusal. So that, that sort of summarises my view, I think, to my younger self. My younger self is pretty hapless. I don't really want to go back and talk to him directly. <laughs> I think I would say to my younger perspective um, that my younger self, in as far as my poetic endeavour, spent too much time worrying about things that didn't matter. Uh, um, and I'd say, you know, sort of look at the big stuff. Every, you know, sort of too often my younger self stumbled across something that was insightful or a good poem. Uh, but it was a stumble. And I think I'd say, um, don't be afraid. Um, you got this. Uh, just, just get some perspective uh, and take things easy. Um, my, my, just finally, my um, estimation, a lot of what I see in the poetry world is there are a lot of people uh, who are too concerned about the fact that they be good poets rather than they write good poems. Uh, I think there's a difference between those things. Get your ego out of it and start concentrating on what you're adding to the world. That's what I'd say. Thank you, both of you. I'd agree with that. Yeah. So, so look, I'm just going to um, put something in the chat then. Uh, this isn't a, a, a sales fair, but uh, it's important to buy books, as we all know. Uh, certainly, uh, when we first had our Zoom to prepare this, we were doing a bit of bookshelf envy as we as we sat looking at our background, backgrounds. And I think they were all real backgrounds rather than fake ones as well. So um, if you want to go and buy some of Jeff and John's poetry, it's, of course, widely available. But we decided we would particularly promote Pitt Street Poetry uh, as a, 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 an organisation which... Uh, publishes both and which is worthy of support and if you go on the website right now this is what you will read our featured poet this week is the very first reprobate we've published back in 2012 John Fulcher has published 11 collections of poetry over the last 35 years dot 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 <laughs> and he has been anointed as the first ever PSP poet of the week so if that's not a theological statement I don't know what is <laughs> I think so far the only one Tim <laughs> Maybe absolutely. Well, I think that make you know uniqueness is also a theological attribute, which poses its own problems in Christianity as as in other places. Um, so we have had two requests actually. There's one more question that's come in. I'll, I'll I'll leave you. I'll read you out. But in the meantime, I think as we answer it, maybe you can think about if if you if we've got a bit of time before eight o'clock. So if you're able to give us one more poem each, I think that would be lovely. Uh, there was a specific request for Fade to White, but I'll leave that with you, Jeff, and see whether that's one of the ones you would, would like to, to, to look at. Oh. Mm -hmm. but I didn't hear what poem they said. Fade to White is the one that was being requested. Uh, I'm not sure where that is. Okay, but it, as anyway. as you think about what you want to do, there is there is a poem, a question here from Carmen, Carmel Summers. Do you find that writing a poem provides you with insights that surprise you? I think, John, you've talked about that a little already, but... Carmel is well on the money there. Mm. Um, that all the best poems uh, surprise you. I mean, the reason you write poems is to understand yourself and the place your place in the world. That's what it's all about. That's why people do it. Uh, and so it's not surprising that you find things that you just surprise and delight you uh, otherwise I wouldn't be bothered um, there was a, um, a, a, a poet um, a, um, an earlier Australian poet in the 60s Martin Johnson said if you want to communicate with someone use a television don't write I uh, use a telephone don't write a poem uh, and I think that was pretty accurate thank you Jeff do you want to chip in on that uh, no, I think I've, I've heard that line before. I think John Tranter said that, but maybe Martin and John were quite good friends, so maybe they shared yeah. somewhere. Certainly true. Uh, poetry is not just a means of communication. It's uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit more than that in Australia. 
And we will, of course, be broadcasting this recording afterwards. So for what it's worth, if you want to find it on YouTube, uh, you can go to the Holy Cross Hackett YouTube channel. Uh, we might also have it on the Sir Margaret's one. Uh, but so if you do want to um, communicate around this this discussion on the subject, then you'll, you'll be able to do so uh, in due course. Uh, so Jeff and John, if you'd like to read us a final poem each, we'd love to hear from you. John's first, he's going first. Okay, uh, I'm just going to write, uh, uh, read a uh, short poem uh, uh, from uh, Dancing with Stephen Hawking, which is called Prodigal. In the clear light, the fields are born again. Abandoning effort, I wander alone to the next village. Sheep bow their heads to the grass as if in silent prayer, while the wind is chanting in the bushes by the stream that withheld darkness. A canola crop on the hillside, parring of the sun. Its furnace transfigured to brute frailty. When I walk among the, when I walk among them, the flowers part like shallow water, light spilling from the sky, a kind of rain, and independent now. Far off, someone is running towards me. And I'll finish with this poem called The Second Law, I, The Second Law of Thermodynamics. And it's fairly simple. I'm not even sure it's on the topic, but I think it is in, in some strange way. Walking out at six in autumn, strolling through the red and gold, you catch the whiff of roast potatoes floating on the early cold. The sharpened air is rich with gravy, the carbons of a passing car. The time of day and time of year combined tell you what you are. The evening star is up already and in the branches very soon as you turn in at your back door will be the message of the moon. The red meat and the trees are stained with what is scattered at your feet. The epic of your own five senses is each day growing more complete. Is that a good ending? <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank, thank you both very much indeed. It's been a real joy to have you along. Um, I'm just going to come in here because we decided that uh, we would have a third voice to end this reading. Uh, before we do, I just want to thank Hi. you all for your questions. Uh, and I thank you, uh, especially John and Jeff, for being part of this. And, and watch this space for further things happening at Holy Cross Hackett. We're looking to do a lot more things like this uh, and to get people in a room as, as soon as we can, and including John and Jeff with some uh, jazz and uh, conviviality as soon as the COVID situation allows. Um, so thank you. But we, we were talking about this at, at yep. the start and we, we thought that we would uh, just make a nod to the venue uh, which is hosting uh, and pick a piece of poetry which is rather more ancient than any of, our, any of us in this room. Uh, it comes from uh, more than 2,000 years ago and I, I think we can call this a, a, quite a prose poem on the subject of, of conviction and doubt. Uh, so I'm just going to read that now for us as we close. Elijah went into the desert 40 days and 40 nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. 
and after the fire a still small voice so thank you and goodbye and see you soon i hope very much and uh, god bless you all if that's the sentiment you can you can accept on your own terms i'm going to stop the recording now <laughs>